we work with colleges and universities to obviously recruit students. Um, and as we are working with those students and we prepare them, we have a very interesting feature in our platform, which actually focuses on matching people appropriately, kind of like a dating app, you know, Andrew, you're, you're married, but hey, once in a while, or maybe, you know, some friends, you know, <laughs> yeah, don't say once in a while, do not say <laughs> once in a while, bro. You're not about to get me in trouble. I don't know nothing about them dating apps, but no, I've heard of them, right? You've heard of them. Okay. And okay. And you know about them. Okay. I've, I know right. about them. <laughs> Here you go. So, uh one of the uh, features that we have on our platform is we have algorithms where as students are matriculating through our curriculum, we're collecting data points. We're trying to find out, you know, who you are, what are you interested in? What are your strengths? And when employers come to us looking for interns, we match them up based on that information with the best applicable prospects for their opportunity. All right. Welcome back to Custom Journeys. We're excited to be here in the recording studio at the IN Center here in Houston, Texas. And while you're watching, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and YouTube. You can also follow the pod on Instagram if you go to at Custom Journeys. That's C-U-S-T-E-M Journeys. And today we're so excited to have Jeff Wallace. Jeff Wallace is a director of strategic partnerships at Ampersand. And this is an organization dedicated to providing college students with professional development training and internships. Throughout his career, he's been the CEO of Urban League. He's been the president of Altus Foundation and president and CEO of Houston's Black Chamber of Commerce. We're very lucky, fortunate, and blessed to have Mr. Jeffrey Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Wallace, for being here Thank today. Thank you, Eli. I appreciate that intro. I told you he getting his radio voice I, right. I was like, who is this? He, be, he turned it on. He real good with it, man. He professional, NPR. Right. Yeah, so, hey, man, Jeff, thanks for taking time out to chat with us again. Um, thanks for bearing with us as we set up everything as well. You know, we're getting better at this thing, but, you know, sometimes think ta things take longer than expected. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it, man. So um, being here in the Ion Center, man, I've been fortunate to meet so many great people um, I happen to work with, I met somebody that you work with and they recommended that we inter interview you for the podcast. Um, so you work at Ampersand, like Eli said, you guys focus on internships. Can you kind of just tell us a little bit more about the program, what you guys do on a day to day and like, what's your whole, your goal with the, with the project? Sure. <clears throat> so Ampersand is a, a technology company. Okay. First and foremost, uh, the company has been around for about two years and <clears throat> I like to think that we focus on performance optimization. Um, yeah, the quick spill is we focus on training and internship placement, but if you've ever worked, um, in an internship setting as either a participant or an employer, you understand that, uh, there are a lot of factors that go into someone doing well in that environment. So what Ampersand does is we offer uh, a training curriculum to prepare people for success in a professional environment. Um, we have 13 modules, over 80 different lessons in that curriculum, and we focus on pillars such as uh, teamwork, understanding diversity, critical thinking, uh, professionalism, et cetera, to make sure that the student is actually a commodity and can provide a return of investment to an employer, you know, when they're in that opportunity. Um, we work with colleges and universities to obviously recruit students. Um, and as we are working with those students and we prepare them, we have a very interesting, um, feature in our platform, which actually focuses on matching people appropriately, kind of like a dating app, you know, Andrew, you're, you're married, but hey, once in a while, or maybe, you know, some friends, you know. <laughs> Yeah, don't say once in a while. Do not say once in a while, bro. You're not about to get me in trouble. I don't know nothing about them dating apps, but no, I've heard of them, right? You've heard of them. Okay, in their, okay in you know about them. Okay. I've, I know right. about them. There you go. So uh, one of the uh, features that we have on our platform is we have algorithms where as students are matriculating through our curriculum, we're collecting data points. We're trying to find out, you know, who you are, what are you interested in, what are your strengths? And when employers come to us looking for interns, we match them up based on that information 
with the best applicable prospects for their opportunity. Why? Because we want win-win situations across the board. Another aspect I think is worth mentioning with Ampersand is the fact that we actually provide the human touch. So it's not just you're going through, you know, a, a platform, you know, a technical curriculum. You're also working with internship success coaches that are working with you as you're going through that process to make sure that you have absorbed the information, you know, kind of like if you were getting, um, you know, you were defending your dissertation, right? I'm talking about and, Eli now. Uh, yeah, you, I got, you got my ears Eli, perked up. Right. Yeah. Eli. <laughs> got my attention. Absolutely. <laughs> because you, you, you have to be able to defend that dissertation, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to speak about it. Mm -hmm. And we want people to be able to exude, you know, what they've learned in the course of an internship. So we have people that are going to make sure that that happens. So we try to make win-wins for everybody. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that's great. Um, I really like that, that you guys kind of add the human touch component to it. And me and Eli were just talking, uh, maybe like last week or so, cause he got a chance to go to like, was like a career development retreat or something like that. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I went to a career development retreat up in Chicago okay. where I actually got some coaching from some folks that worked in the corporate sector for a very long time. Awesome. And so they talked to us how to, you know, best, uh, rules of thumb when working in the corporate world. Uh, but also, but how to represent yourself and how to represent your values. It is very important. And, and, and it's a commodity that a lot of people don't maximize. You know, career development is not really teached in high school. Mm -hmm. In college, it's there, but you have to access it. It doesn't necessarily become a part of, of, of most people's um, professional being mm -hmm. until it's necessary. Right. Um, and that's one of the, the, the spaces I think that we occupy that's very critical to success in, in, in professional life. Yeah, that's really good. Cause I, we were just chatting about his experience that he had and they were talking about like going through emails and like different situations and stuff comes up. Mm -hmm. And like you said, we don't learn that. So, I mean, I would imagine like some interns that don't get to work with you guys, they go in just sending all kinds of crazy emails okay. and all kinds of signatures, <laughs> unprofessional email names and all kinds of things mm -hmm. like sure. that. Sure. So I think it's great what you guys are doing. And so is it completely free to the students or do the students have to pay? Do the company pay? How does that part work out? So it's completely free to students. Okay. Completely free. Um, we do, um, obviously charge universities and colleges. Yeah. And at this particular time, that's going to change very soon. But at this particular time, we're actually not even charging the companies right now. Oh, wow. Um, because universities and colleges are paying the bills to a certain extent. Uh, we don't have to pass on the cost of our services to the business partners that we work with. So that's a, right now it's a very good opportunity to work with Ampersand on a lot of different fronts, whether you're a student or you're a company that's looking to bring in, you know, uh, students either for enhanced labor depth mm -hmm. or you're looking to add to your, your talent, talent pool pipeline. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, these are paid internships, these right? Paid. All right, just make, make sure that's, that's out there. I know some companies be like, hey, you're getting the experience. And I get it in some cases, but for the most part, I, I think internships should be paid. So that's great that you guys are doing that. As long as you don't pass out from hunger, you you know, it's a good opportunity. Yeah, I get it. No, we, no these internships are paid. Gotcha. Wow. Uh, one other follow-up for you real quick. Are there any, like, restrictions in terms of, like, do you have to be at a certain university or, like, can you be anywhere in the country and sign up? Or? No. And that's one of the great things about us. We don't necessarily... The criteria that we basically focus on is finishing the curriculum and finishing the curriculum well. We're not getting into GPAs. We're not getting into what university you're going to, because when it's all said and done, your performance is what's going to be most important. So that's what we try to key in on and focus on and, uh, and make sure that, you know, we're accentuating those skill sets that we know are going to translate to success in the internship. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Um, so one other question, how long is it? You said it's like 13 modules. Is there like a, how long does that typically take? Or is there like a set time that you have to wait before you can be like placed or matched with a company? Yeah, it's a great question. So the curriculum is a, a minimum of 50 hours. Okay. It's a minimum of 50 hours. Now that can be spread out as long as the student needs to spread it out. So we've had students that have finished it in a weekend, you know, a little bit over a weekend, three days. Uh, we've had students that have taken, you know, four months because it's self-paced. Mm. The question is, how quickly do you want to be Ampersand certified so that you have the ability to get a job? 
Okay. True. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. True. And that's not something you can dictate to, you know, anyone. You know, that's their own personal agenda and, mm -hmm. you know, time constraints, et cetera. Uh, now for me, if, uh, if I know that at the end of this journey, there's going to be a job that is going to get finished pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. I'm going to be working those internship success coaches. <laughs> like, yeah. Like you again. Right. <laughs> that's right. right. Um, and obviously a big aspect of what we do is we actually have a business development component that goes out and works with businesses and brings them into the fold. That's what I'm actually in charge of, you know, bringing these businesses into the mix so that we have the ability to give these talented students an opportunity. So okay. not just a software company, you know, the human gotcha. touch, the human factor is very big in what we do. Gotcha. And so since you're on the business development side, there are opportunities, are there opportunities out there for students that like are pursuing like an engineering degree or a computer science or technology? Any, if they're in the STEM space period, are there internship opportunities for them? Yeah, the we're, we're developing those opportunities now. Okay. Uh, traditionally, we have pretty much been in the business operations space, mm -hmm. <laughs> but now, you know, we have people with technical disciplines coming to us, which excites me because <clears throat> I used That's to work awesome. with companies like, you know, Shell, Chevron, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I understand first and foremost, the economic opportunities that go along with that. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, number two, um, technology, STEM related disciplines are always going to be bread and butter for industry. So when you have people like that in your fold, you, you provide a bigger arsenal to the business community. Okay. We're now coming with, you know, uh, professionals that will be the backbone of your company that are quite frankly, not easy to find and eventually are going to be uh, very difficult to, to land because of the, of the talent pool. Gotcha. No, that's a great point. Um, Eli, did you have anything to add before we moved on to, yeah, to the next segment? Yeah, no, uh, I think it's wonderful the flexibility that the program offers. I'm curious though, uh, at what point in a student's career is it more beneficial for them? Early college or late college, their seniors may be applying for jobs. At what point would be most beneficial for them to do a program like this? Dr. Eli, I love your question for a number of reasons, but first of all, to answer your question, I'd say, you know, high school, cool. high school age, all right? All right. right? All right. You should, th this should be something that is foremost on your mind by the time you're a high school senior, right? Um, because understand that the things that you're trying to do, whether you're going to vocational school, whether you're going to a junior college, whether you're going to, you know, a college or a university, you alluded to it earlier, Andrew, there's a purpose for this. Is it just social engagement or ultimately are you trying to be economically self-sufficient, mm -hmm. right? Understanding that there are certain soft skills, certain, um, uh, skill sets that you can't be taught in necessarily, you know, a college environment mm -hmm. that you're going to need in order to have your, your skill sets translated to success is very crucial. So, you know, I'm a big advocate, Look, as soon as you're about to go to college, you should be getting involved in some type of career development mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, if that career development opportunity is, could potentially lead to a full time or an internship opportunity, then that's something you need to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Right. So the earlier, the better. Okay. The earlier, the better. I'm a, I'm a big advocate. You should start teaching career development classes in elementary school. Mm -hmm. That's my position. Mm -hmm. Okay. But bare minimum. That should definitely be a focus when you're getting into that, you know, 16, 17, 18 year range. Right. Yeah. It's the course you're never told about, but you should Absolutely. definitely take. But is probably more crucial than any, you know, class you're ever going to take. Mm -hmm. Point blank. It's true. I, I agree with that statement because I think um, I was I was playing around. I tell people this all the time. Like when I went into industry and worked at General Motors, there was a time where I felt like, why did I even go to college? <laughs> like they going to teach you. <laughs> Everything they need you to know, like on the job. <laughs> and it's not like as an engineer, we study like calculus and one, two, and three and <laughs> physics and all that stuff. <laughs> right. But when you go to industry, you're not going out there and doing integrals and derivatives. You're working with people, dealing with people, communicating and all that stuff. So those professional development skills really come in handy. So I'm, I'm really glad that you guys are doing the work that you're doing. Uh, real quick, if somebody wants to go um, sign up for Ampersand, how do they like <laughs> find you guys and stuff like that? So... To sign up is, is very easy. You're just going to go to uh, www.ampersandpro.com, ampersandpro.com. Uh, ampersand 
you know, for those who don't know, is the uh, the and simple. Yeah, that's the name of the and simple, right? Um, our technical name for our company is called Ampersand Professionals. But you can't copyright the ampersand. <laughs> gotcha. But we generally just go by ampersand. All so right. uh, it, that's that's how quickly you can actually get started. Cool. You could get started today at any time. Dope. No, I think that's great. You got online training. You got counseling with career coaches, things of that nature. So I think that's really great. Yes. Uh, Eli, do you have any other questions before we move on to Factor Cap? No, you good? Let's, let's move forward. All right, cool. So we're going to switch it up. We got like a little segment we added not too long ago. It's called Factor Cap. Uh, just to kind of like get your hot take, your, your quick, uh, <laughs> your quick thoughts real quick. Um, so it'll be maybe like three to five questions. Just answer fact. If you think it's true cap, if you think it's false. And, um, if you want, you can give a, or it probably should give a brief explanation, but limit it to like 60 seconds or less yeah. for each question. Okay. Gotcha. You're not going to ask me about Will Smith, are you? Uh, maybe. No, no. Just brought that up. <laughs> How are your All thoughts right. from a professional? <laughs> okay. No, nah, we'll, we'll leave that one alone. Uh, that's becoming a verb now. I'm not going to Will Smith you. That's crazy. But yeah, man. Right. <laughs> so uh, first question. Um, let me see. Let me go back to it. All right. So factor cap. And this is one that we ask a lot of people. Factor cap is not what you know, but who you know that matters. So in other words, your your network is more important than the skills that you have. No, that's 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 fact premium. <laughs> um, that, in terms of, of what weighs more, there's absolutely no question that who you know is going to matter than what you know. Uh, I have met some incredibly brilliant people in my life who have had great difficulty moving from their station because their network wasn't strong, uh, because they didn't have the ability to engage. They didn't have the ability to, on the spot, sell an idea, sell a concept, sell themselves. So without question, who you know is... Gotcha. That's more important. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So uh, next one, this is dealing with salary negotiations. Factor cap, you should always negotiate your salary. I would say fact. I would say fact. And the reason I pause is because I think it's, it's how you do it that probably matters most. And you have to understand where the opportunity is in the negotiation. Okay. Um, first and foremost, if you are a STEM, uh, if you're in a STEM discipline and whatnot, understand that there's going to be a certain amount of value that comes with that anyway. Right. But understanding how to express the various facets of not only your expertise in that particular area, but understanding how that translates to success with the business, I think is extremely key. Gotcha. Dope. All right. So you've had a lot of experience, I'm assuming with networking. Um, factor cap, LinkedIn is the best way to network with people. No, absolutely not. All right. Uh, quick elaboration. Uh, technology is never going to replace face-to-face -face interaction. It's never going to replace it. Uh, organizations, uh, direct interfacing is still, in my opinion, the best way to build your network. People know you, people have the ability to have intimate conversations with you. Uh, you have the ability to engage, you know, in environments that are conducive to you making connections. LinkedIn is a platform. Uh, it's, it's great for, for, for quick connections, but ultimately networking is a job and most people don't know how to do that job. Mm. Good, good, good. All right. We got like two more for you. So we did our research on you, found out you're in, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha. <laughs> oh, <sick> yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. So factor cap being in a fraternity has helped you professionally. There's no question about it. Absolutely. First of all, being in a brotherhood of like-minded men who want to progress is a very, very powerful mechanism in any man's life. The fact that I, you know, when I pledged, I had, uh, 15 other line brothers. We stayed in contact to this day. We've seen each other through good times, bad times. But every last one of us is a professional doing positive things. And if somebody slips, there's a standard mm. that you're going to have to adhere to. And we will say very quickly, yeah, you're kind of slipping, but <laughs> <laughs> you're not walking the line. You're not walking the line. So, and that's very important for us to hold each other accountable. So that's why I think a fraternity is just extremely, extremely important. It have, has been important to me anyway. 
Gotcha. All right, I got one more for you. So um, you've had an extensive career, not only in leadership roles and nonprofit roles, but also in recruiting as well mm -hmm. and, and helping out with diversity program for different companies. Um, one of the biggest barriers to entry for STEM is, is the financial component, like college tuition, things of that nature. Sure. So we want your honest opinion. Factor cap, college tuition should be free. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And the reason for that is <clears throat> the people who graduate from college um, directly and indirectly are going to be the return of investment for the community. Mm -hmm. So when you eliminate financial barriers, you're creating opportunities um, and, uh, and situations that have the ability to have a magnificent return on the overall community. Every single time the United States graduates an engineer, we're graduating an asset. Every time we, we, mm -hmm. we create a doctor, we're creating an opportunity to cure cancer, right? Every single time you create, you know, a, um, a computer science, you have the ability to protect this country against cyber attacks, mm -hmm. right? So there's always going to be a return of investment. I think sometimes schools get a little bit more into the business. Well, maybe it's not schools, but many times the business of education does not take into consideration the fact that we are developing assets that are going to essentially be a, a product and, you know, a, a beneficiary for the, the entire country. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Without question. Awesome. No, I love that. Eli was over there. I'm uh, grinning from ear to ear. Yeah. Not in his head. So nah, no, a, that, yeah. that resonates. But yeah. to be honest, man, that's the first time I heard somebody put it that way. Like every time they graduate a STEM professional, they're, they're producing an asset. And so like a lot of times people say, Hey, the money has to come from somewhere. You just bringing on all this debt and they don't look at like, Hey, what's the ROI? What's the return exactly. on the investment? And when you look at like what's going on in the world right now with like Russia and Ukraine, and you got cyber attacks that happen each and every day on these uh, different companies and countries as well. So it's like, uh, we need more assets definitely. And I think what you're saying, investment is definitely worth it. No question, no question. Yeah, I wish, uh, I hope one day we take a, a broader look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, Eli, you want to kick off the professional development um, sure. part? Sure. Or you want me to, are you good? No, no, I got it. I'll, I'll do the first one. All right, cool. Uh, so, so Jeff, you, you touched on how important it is to, in whatever focus or subject that you're, you're, you're doing, the ability to, to uh, present yourself, present your ideas in a convincing way, right. you know, selling yourself, quote unquote, Absolutely. right? Uh, what advice would you give to young people and how they can improve that skill specifically to improve their personal brand, since that's such an important thing right. in the right. In industry? Right. Mm -hmm. So I would probably say, um, get involved in in team sports, get involved in team sports, team sports, in my opinion, it doesn't matter whether or not you're good. You're going to be dealing with personalities. You're going to be dealing with challenge. You're going to be dealing with objectives that translates very well into developing your own personal brand. You've got to figure out a way on this team to make yourself stand out, to make yourself a positive contributor. And, you know, that's why I love Pee Wee sports. Uh, mm -hmm. My son, I have him in, involved in everything I can get him involved in because I know the skills are going to translate. Mm -hmm. They're transferable skills. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't necessarily understand the capacity or don't have the capacity necessarily because of your age to understand how this is going to translate into future success, um, people who work with you, people, you know, parents, et cetera, they should be looking to get you engaged in, in those opportunities. That that's kind of a quick win. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's the chess club, Okay. develop okay. a competitive edge. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not a fan of participation awards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I feel that to make it in, you know, any kind of career, you've got to have a, a, a competitive edge about you and that can only be forged through environments where you're being challenged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Society has gone in a lot of different directions, and, and this is not a criticism of, of any particular thought process, mm -hmm. but I will say this. Teaching competition is the first way for you to be able to say, I belong here. Mm -hmm. I can hold my own. Mm -hmm. Okay. As you get older, you're getting more into, you know, some of the more professional career development dynamics, but that foundation is very important. Mm -hmm knowing how to withstand the criticism and the scrutiny 
uh, that you're going to be dealing with in any aspect of life, I think is highly critical. So that, that would be one of the first things I said, get involved in something in school that is team oriented. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. As a, as a follow-up question to that, the branding part of it. Um, so like, let's say somebody's like an early career professional or just a recent college graduate and they're working at their first job or something like that. Sure. Um, what, what can they kind of, or let me back up even better. So I'll tell a little bit of a brief story. So when I first got hired at General Motors, I was thankful that they assigned me like, I had my supervisor, but they had me a mentor as well within the group. And so like literally like every day, um, he would check on me, see what's going on. We would walk down to the garage below us on the first floor. We would walk underneath the different cars. He would teach me all that stuff. Right. But then also he would sit down with me side by side and would pull up the org chart. Yeah. And be like, hey, this is, this person right here is 26. They're on the track to be a chief engineer by the time they're 28. Sure. This person right here is doing this. And so a big part that he was trying to get me to understand is that, um, number one, you need to brand yourself a certain way if you have a particular goal in mind that you're trying to pursue. Right. And then um, number two, you need to be out there networking. It's not just what you do between 9 to 5 that matters. It's also after work from 5 to 9 p.m what you do in terms of networking and organizations and stuff that matters as well. Absolutely. So in terms of like the branding component as a follow-up to Eli's question, mm -hmm. um, what's some things that people can do in order to brand themselves uh, better if they know that, hey, I want to be uh, a CFO or a CEO or even a mid-level manager or something like that. What can they do in terms of branding in order to like get the management team to start thinking about, hey, Dr. Iglesias wants to be engineering manager. We should start thinking about him. What can he do? Or what can we do in terms of branding for that? So I'm going to preface my remark with um, a real life example okay. of, uh, of a friend of mine who works at a, a global technology company. And he was interviewing uh, various candidates for a pretty lucrative uh, position. And he ended up hiring somebody who graduated in like, uh, obviously you're going to know what school they went to in ag business, ag business. Mm -hmm. That's their, that's what their degree was in. And this person was a farmer. And what my friend did was when he interviewed people, he asked them, what do you do with your spare time? Okay. Why is that important? Because what you do in your spare time really speaks to who you are mm. as opposed to you know, you giving kind of a pat answer about, you know, uh, about the actual job that you're trying to get. Right. So for like, for instance, if you're an engineer and you like to cook, right. I know you like to put things together. I understand that your mind works in a certain way, right? A lot of people will throw that away in an interview process. They'll be like, oh, you know, I, yeah, I read and I, I like to bike and I go to the mountains and I can. What they're not thinking of is they're asking you this for a reason. Mm -hmm. Translate what you do in your spare time to the fact that this is my focus. Why is that going to matter? Because that person is going to start believing this person is really committed to this path. As opposed to they're just doing this because they got a degree and they're trying to get a job. So in my opinion, if you're developing your professional brand, what you need to be thinking about is what are you doing in your spare time? Right that contributes to your goal. If I'm not hearing that you are in your spare time, you know, connected to, and you're, let's say, uh, you know, a, a civil engineer, right. And, and you're not connected to, um, you know, learning about, uh, various projects, you know, various construction projects, you're not, you know, taking classes on project management, right. You're not, um, you know, you're, you're not necessarily focused on, uh, doing things that contribute to the actual discipline, then I'm going to question your commitment to the discipline to a certain extent. So to me, make sure that in your spare time, you are aligning yourself, whether that's organizations, right? Whether that's, um, uh, literature that you're, that you're reading and you're getting insight on, you're doing things to make sure that you have as much capacity as possible to basically, you know, create a pathway to in a particular direction that makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. So to me, those are the things that really matter in terms of, of building your brand. Yeah. Your personal brand. No, that's a good point. I think, um, I know when I graduated college, got my first job, I felt like the job was over. Like in terms of like, I landed the dream job. So I felt like, Hey, I did my job, my part. Like 
Yeah. I don't know what's next, but I think a lot of us when we're 22, 23, don't really realize that, hey, you got to still invest in yourself and continue your own education and mm -hmm. networking a big part of that as well, of course, but yeah. uh, certifications and all that's good stuff. Yeah, people are going to see you moving. Yeah. People are going to see you moving. Okay, that that micro that that uh, that that camera, yes, of course, is going to be on you when you're talking to a business professional. But people watch mm -hmm. you when you don't think they're watching. So it's a far fetched concept for many people to think like, okay, what wh what difference does it matter what I'm doing when I'm not at the job? It matters because it's a behavioral track record that you are building. Okay, some of the best jobs that I've got did not come from the interview. They came because someone saw me in some other space. Mm -hmm. They saw me in some other space doing something and they made a mental note. Okay. Okay. This is, this, this guy's together. It wasn't an interview, Yeah, but they made that mental note and that's come up time and time again, particularly as I've gotten older. You know what? You know, a friend of mine, we have a, a mutual friend or I saw you speak at such and such and such. That's happened to me at least a dozen times, mm. you know, in, in professional engagements. And it's because what you do in your spare time is going to build your brand. It's going to come full circle. I absolutely guarantee it. Gotcha. Yeah. If you're moving in that way. Right. Yeah. 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 No, that's a good point. Um, okay. Awesome advice. Awesome. 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 So you, throughout your career, you've been able to, you were, had an extensive, like we said earlier, had an extensive background in recruiting. You've been the COO, Chief Operating Officer of uh, Houston Urban League. Mm. You've been the CEO and President of the Black Chamber of Commerce for Greater Houston area. Um, so you've been able to kind of, and you've also been like, what, the president of a oh, nonprofit? Yeah. All right, so you've kind of been able to go from pretty much anywhere, right? A lot of career mobility that you've been able to kind of establish throughout your career. Um, what advice would you give for others who are just starting out in their career early on who may, maybe they're interested in one thing initially, but they realize, hey, I'm, maybe they're an engineer today. But like, you know, I got like a business mindset. I want to start my own company or I want to run the business aspect of a company one day. What advice would you give them in order to like transition from one career into another? So I would focus always on transferable skills. Skill sets that are going to matter no matter what you're doing. Some of that is business. Invest in business acumen. Understand finances. Understand how to how to finance a business. Understand uh, how to uh, how to invest, right? Understand uh, how money works, right? Understand how to speak. Understand strategic communication. These these are transferable skills. And as I said, I've met some brilliant people in my life. People who uh, th their intellectual capacity was scary. But as I mentioned before, they couldn't move past their station in life because they could not communicate strategically. They had to be a slave to the position that they had because they hadn't invested their money properly. See, all of these things matter in terms of creating mobility. See, when you have, and I'm probably giving away a little bit too much here. Okay. No, I'll get into it. Too, okay. When you have we got your financial ducks in a row, yeah. you don't have to accept trash. Mm. You don't have to accept that which you don't want to do or that which you know is not for you. You don't have to accept inhumane treatment from your boss when you got your financial ducks in a row, right? Mm, yeah. That's flexibility. Mm, yeah. When you have the ability to be flexible and you have latitude in your communication, you can talk to, as they say, kings and paupers. Because one day a pauper could be a king, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And your ability to go ahead and maneuver yourself in ways in which, you know, you can connect with people is extremely important. So what I find sometimes with people in STEM related disciplines is that they become pigeonholed mm -hmm. and they, they become nuclear focused <laughs> yeah. on doing what they do and investing in their craft, but they have not developed the transferable skills that will give them the ability to move with the market. Gotcha. Right. Cause we, Hey, look, Dot com businesses will come and go, um, you know, startups will come and go. Um, people have to be able to move in industry in a way that allows them to continue to accentuate their strengths, but be able to be placed in different roles. Yeah. Right. Whether that's the founder of a company or whether you're looking to, you know, 
get a, a great opportunity with, you know, another company. Those are the kind of things that people really need to start focusing on or should focus on. Yeah. When you brought up the money part, I was getting excited. I mean, I heard somebody say something similar. They call it FU money. Like, <laughs> yeah, you don't have enough money to retire necessarily, but like, let's say somebody, <laughs> your boss is tripping on you all the time. He's not a good supervisor. She's not a good supervisor. You got your money stacked up. You got your FU money. You can say, mm -hmm. F you walk away and be like, yo, I'm either go resign until I find something else or whatever the case might be, go start your own business or whatever the case may be. Um, well, I don't want to get into it too deep, but I'm gonna go off script a little bit. Yeah, yeah go for it. Um, <laughs> what, like we talk about money a lot on the show, salaries and stuff like that, but we don't necessarily talk about like the investing component of it. Sure. And so I don't want you to give financial advice cause I don't want nobody trying to sue you or me or Eli, mm -hmm. uh, but um, what in your own personal experience has been beneficial for you in terms of like, once you're making a good amount of income, once you're making that high paying STEM salary, what's a good, like, what's been beneficial for you in terms of like where you put your money that's been paying off for you personally? Well, one of the things that's not on my resume is I'm president of an investment group. Okay. Okay. Uh, I founded it with, uh, 10 of my friends. Nice. And, and we've been doing this for a while now. And we meet on a regular basis and it's a, it's an LLC. Yeah. Um, it'll never, ever be on my, you know, LinkedIn or resume, but that's a very important yeah. part of my life. Why? Because we're looking at, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, having real assets. Yeah. Okay. If you are in a STEM related discipline, understand you're going to be making, you know, measurably higher money than the average person. Okay because of the specialty of what you do. Mm -hmm. Okay. We understand that question is, what are you doing with that money? Yeah. And you, you have to always, you, you asked a great question before, how do you brand yourself? One of the ways you brand yourself is that you are a commandeer of your money, right? You're doing something with your money. You're, you're actually making your money work for you to the point where you're making that money when you're asleep. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's one of the, the important things to, to, to really start thinking about, particularly when you're, you know, that 18, 19, 20 year old. Okay. The trajectory I'm on, does it lead me to being a multimillionaire? If money is your focus, yeah. it may not be your focus, but if it is, is the trajectory that I'm on leading me to being a multimillionaire mm. or is the trajectory I'm on leading me to be, um, you know, sound financial? Cause there's a difference. Yeah. Is my income always going to be based on what someone gives me? Or am I ever going to have control over that space? Mm -hmm. That's a big question mm -hmm. that you need to start asking yourself and answering, you know, when you are 18, 19, because ultimately when I see a professional, I look at them and my thought process is where else can this person be and command this respect? I've met some great computer scientists that I've said, there's absolutely no way I, I, you wouldn't be allowed to run a daycare. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. No. okay. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, okay. And, I, and then I have met, Hey, look him up. John Huffmeister. When I was at Shell. Yeah. John Huffmeister graduated in political science, I think from Kansas state university and became the leader of one of the largest energy technology companies in the world. That is a person who had flex. That's a person who was a commandeer, a person who had presence, mm -hmm. who had the ability to brand himself in, in ways in which you look at him and you just see this is a leader. So it's those types of, of attributes that I think really make a person stand out. And that's not going to happen just focusing specifically on your your content area mm -hmm. that can only happen with you taking the time to develop yourself in other areas, you know, having a financial plan, having a financial advisor, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Having a mentor, having the ability to go find your mentor, right? Having the ability to engage, right? Having a network. Mm -hmm. These are all the things that are going to be transcending, you know, power dynamics, you know, particularly as you get older. Gotcha. All right, one quick follow-up. Are there any particular um, uh, investment vehicles, like um, whether it's investing in, like, the stock market or anything like that? He's trying to get me sued. 
But go ahead. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going. I'm not going to pin you down to it. Let, 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 let's rephrase the question. Let's rephrase the question. Yeah. To, what, man, I, look, look, you buying Apple? Size. What you buying? What stock you buying? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, Bye, speaking on the 18 to 21 year old, what's the first step they can take in moving in that direction? Yeah, I, I would probably say if I'm 18 years old, what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably go out and get a financial advisor. Okay. Yeah. People will say I don't have any. I have enough money to get a financial advisor. Yeah, you do. Mm-hmm. Can you contribute $25 a month? Can you contribute $50 a month? See, a financial advisor is going to help you develop a plan. When you're sick, who do you go to? The doctor, doctor right? Mm-hmm. When you're in legal, you know, turmoil, who do you go to? Yeah. An attorney, right? right? A lot of people don't seek out financial advisors until they quote unquote feel that they have enough money, but the planning should be taking place early on. Okay, matter of fact, as far as I'm concerned, if you're 16 years old and you have a job and you have the discipline to allocate money every month, you should be meeting with a financial advisor. And there are plenty of financial advisors who will see you and say, yeah, you're, you're, you're contributing a small amount now, but in 10 years, mm-hmm. you're going to be contributing this amount. Yeah. Get the expertise. Look at yourself as a business and start bringing on your business partners. I need a professional mentor. Mentors, by the way, don't just have one mm-hmm. because you don't ever want to have a monolithic perspective when it comes to anything. Mm-hmm. You want to have mm-hmm. sounding boards. Mm-hmm. So get multiple mentors, get a financial advisor, right? Get a, a, a career coach, right? These are the things that you should have as part of your arsenal. So Andrew LLC, by the time you're 20 years old, you already have employees. Yeah. Working, working under your umbrella to develop you. That's, that's, that's very key. That's gotcha. what I would definitely say to a, a younger person. Yeah, man. I, I like that advice. Cause I mean, I think, um, a lot, just to start with, you don't know what you don't know. Like, don't know don't know. and, um, if you're 18, 21, whatever, even now 30, um, there's a lot that we don't know. And I mean, having an older mentor that can kind of help you along the way, helps out a lot. So. Um, I love that. I think it connects well to an analogy we used before in the past, and that is, you know, all the professional athletes that you see out there, they started their careers way before college, oh, way before high school. Absolutely. They've been playing football or basketball since they were little. Absolutely. And so similarly, if you're going to STEM or whatever industry you want, you have to start early. So yeah, that's a great point. No, my, my kids are in an investment group, um, and I have encouraged them, you know, since they were in middle school. I don't want mentors to find you. I want you to find your mentor. And I want you to have the ability to engage people in a way in which they have a vested interest in your development. Yeah. See, that's a different kind of communication. Yeah. Okay. Then, hey, can I come talk to you every month, you know, for 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. As opposed to I've developed a rapport with this person where I know I can come to you to discuss job opportunity. Right. Uh, investment vehicles, relationships, mm-hmm. right? Which we don't, you know, we don't talk about enough, right? Yeah. That has a lot to do with your economic success. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So no, no, I, I, I think you, you really need to go ahead and start arming yourself with the expertise and it's free guys. It's absolutely free. Mm-hmm. It doesn't cost you anything to add this expertise to your life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of relationships real quick, what's your thoughts on Kevin Samuels? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kind of playing with you a little bit, but no, um, it, he says, in my opinion, uh, a lot of good things. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, he's an entertainer, so yeah. I think there's some, some splash there. You of know, course. Time to time. But I think fundamentally, I think he is into a real space that a lot of people don't occupy. And that is the economics of relationships. Okay. Okay. Let me give you a good analogy. You have a mechanical engineer, right? Who's built his career. Okay. He gets married. Um, you know, they become multimillionaires and you know, relationship goes bad. Money separates. Yeah. Right. A lot of people don't necessarily talk about how important it is to build good relationships and the economic need for good relationship building. I think Kevin in a different kind of way really speaks to building wealth, you know, 
and using relationships as a conduit for that. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not going to get into some of the stuff he says, because you probably have female listeners and all that stuff. But the point I think that I think he's, he's really trying to make is, um, we need to go ahead and make sure we're strengthening these relationships. Yeah. You know? Now I, I was just kind of messing with you. I'm surprised you even took it that far. I was for a second hour, I thought about trying to pin you down on something about high value <laughs> men and all this other stuff. But I mean, STEM graduates, they're going to be high value people. So, right. so we, we've, we've they got this a, conversation off line. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've always said, consider at the bare minimum, consider a STEM related career. Mm -hmm. Okay. You could be uglier than a frog's behind right now. Oh no. But that's not going to matter <laughs> right? when you are able to provide someone with financial security. You're going to be a different commodity. Okay. That's a fact. Now we, we can dance around this all we want to. Yeah. Men, men look at women in the, you know, for different things. Women look at men for different things. These, these are facts. Yeah, it is. They, and they stand undisputed. <laughs> fact of the matter is, um, everybody should at least consider it. Cause I have seen people who are not the sharpest tack in the box become, you know, STEM practitioners and are doing extremely well. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, you know, for the guys, they, they can't beat the women off with a stick, <laughs> you know, because yeah, yeah. they're providing intelligence, they're providing foundation, mm -hmm. they're, they're providing discipline, they're providing, you know, financial security. And trust me, uh, as, as women get older, those things become more appreciated. Yeah. Okay. So you know, we, we go as far as you want to with that. I'll talk about that all day, but hey. All right. Cool. That, 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 that was the, that was the hot seat question. I think we can wrap it up here. Andrew. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to push too far, man. But no, we, I wanted to liven it up a little bit. So I appreciate you letting us uh, go there. Yeah. Uh, like, we have about like five minutes left. Yeah. Maybe we're at the close out, but before we do, we do a uh, one topic that we always talk about on this pod. And it's a more philosophical question, since I'm a doctor, I like to think like way sometimes. In the corporate world and also in STEM spaces, you see a lack of diversity, right? Sure. Although there's a plenty of talent from our communities. From your viewpoint, from all your experiences in corporate uh, environments, what needs to change in order to increase that diversity and also increase diversity in the leadership? I'm talking board of trustees at a university, board of directors for a company. Yeah. Et cetera. Yeah. It starts, it starts with family. Okay. It starts with family. And I think, um, you know, my, my son graduated from Prairie View, um, with a math degree and my daughter graduated from Ohio state with a degree in finance. Uh, but those conversations, you know, when, you know, they're 14, 15 and you're have and you're laying things out, you know, about the economic ramifications you know, uh, you know, uh, the economic benefits of choosing STEM, it starts there because the pool has to increase. The, the pool of interest has to increase first. Okay. We, we can talk about companies, uh, how, how many unemployed engineers do you know? All right. How many unemployed yeah. computer science, mm. um, you know, practitioners do you know? You don't know a lot of, them, right? Because their, their skill sets in demand. Mm. So I, I've heard people say, well, you know, maybe the opportunities are not coming. No, companies will hire you if you have the skill set. Mm -hmm. They need it. The question is, are those people rising in the company? And that, in my opinion, speaks to, you know, company management, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the pool, first and foremost, has got to increase. We have got to give more kids of, um, of, of color mm -hmm. into STEM related environments, right? And then the people who direct them in life need to be able to speak to them about the advantages of this and make sure that they understand you're going to be supported in this journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not going to be on an Island. We're going to support you difficult times. We're going to help you find that tutor because it matters to this family for you to finish this. Those kind of conversations have to happen, but ultimately the biggest aspect of that is the pool. You've got to have the pool and we have enough kids in this country. If we're steering them towards these type of opportunities, 
and we're providing them with the right support, they can get through it. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. 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 Yeah. No, we're definitely on board with that. I mean, um, we uh, we definitely believe that more of us Black and Latino students should pursue STEM. Um, I think it's really important. Uh, so real one quick follow up. I'm gonna try and let you maybe limited to two minutes. So I know you got to go in a minute. Um, but you've worked as like a diversity, uh, you've kind of led a diversity initiative at Shell sure. and um, things of that nature. And now there's like a really, really big push for DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. Um, what in your experience, I guess, needs to happen on like the corporate level in order to like um, be a catalyst for some more change in diversity in these corporations? Um, it's a... It's a great question. And what I would probably say is that companies need to understand the financial ramifications of diversity and the financial benefits of diversity. See, many companies don't necessarily look at diversity as being a money-making dynamic. Yeah. They look at it more as a risk management dynamic. Okay. Okay. I need to prevent getting sued. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. I need to prevent these particular things from happening. And I don't think that many companies have really invested in understanding why this makes money. See, a business is in business to make money, right? They're not a nonprofit. Right. Right. So anything that they do has to speak to their bottom line. And I don't think that there has been enough work to make sure that companies understand how diversity does translate into money. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. And it's not just ethnic diversity. I mean, you could have, you know, two Latino men who are very different. Right. Okay. They look at the world very differently. But can the way they look at the world translate to money for the business? Absolutely. But it's the short-sightedness that these companies don't invest, like, for instance, in their talent acquisition. They put millions into that, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't put that same amount of money into understanding how to harness the absolutely enormous power of diversity and being able to market to different groups and being able to, you know, take people with different perspectives to create different solutions for things. Mm -hmm. That's, that, that's the space that, that really needs to be invested in. That's not being invested in. How does diversity make money for mm -hmm. you? Because when it's understood that diversity makes money, this is not a problem. Right. This is yeah. not a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Cause that's what they're going to put out number on it. Yeah, to make it, things move. You you really yeah. do. Yeah. You really do. You really do. Yeah, that's a good point. I think I saw an article recently actually that talked about like the amount of money that companies are missing out on. Oh. And I think I saw like the first it was like one of the first of its kinds in terms of that kind of study. Like it's like millions of dollars that companies are missing out on by not being a diverse company. It's just you have so many more perspectives that are um being considered from the company standpoint, at least some more money. And uh women included in that as well. So man, no, I think that's all great information. Um, man, I feel like I had another question for you, but I know you got to go. Uh, but man, this has been a great talk. A lot of fun yeah. chatting with you. This has been amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I really appreciate you taking time out to come chat with us. Uh, we got like an open door policy for all of our, our, our former guests. So mm -hmm. feel free to come back. Uh, if you want to chat some more, uh, talk some more about Kevin Samuels. Yeah. Son. Do a show on that. Yeah. We, we, we'll do, we'll get into it and be a little side topic. Relationship advice. Uh, before we close out, is there anyone or anything you want to shout out? Uh, first I want to shout out to my beautiful wife, Chantra. I always got to do that. Uh, that's a smart man, right? Here. Like, you better believe it, man. Uh, say, say it one more time. I had to switch the camera. You want to shout out <laughs> shout to Chantra Wallace, okay. my beautiful wife. Um, my, uh, my beautiful children, um, uh, Exante Wallace running for mayor of Prairie View, my daughter, uh, Sable Wallace, who is, uh, an accountant at Apache. Uh, my daughter, Kalina, and my son, uh, Ian, who I affectionately call ID. Um, and shout out to you guys. I really love what you're doing. Um, you know, I should get your autographs right now, you know, because I can see that this is going to continue to ascend to some great heights. Uh, it's great to see young men doing it. So shout out to you guys. Uh, your parents did something right. Yeah. Hey, yeah, we try to give them a little credit every now and then, you know. <laughs> For sure. But now we, we appreciate that, man. I mean, we really have like a big goal to try to increase diversity in STEM. And so we appreciate you coming on and chatting with us about not only the great program that Ampersand is, but a lot of the professional development things that people 
may not be considering it. So thanks again for that. And quick shout out to my ampersand colleagues. Shout out to CEO Ali Danziger for putting together a great company. Shout out to Appersand Pro. Make sure you check that out online. Yeah. And for custom journeys, I'm Eliseo. This is Andrew. Yep. And we're out of here. Peace. Thank you. All good.